This is The Red Line, where we interview three big geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. I've often heard the analogy comparing Southeast Asia to Europe in 1946-47. The war had just ended, the Nazis had been crushed, and Europe has been flattened from six years of total war. And smoky rooms in Washington and Moscow were beginning to draw the new front lines of the world. The Cold War is about to begin. But in 1946, the lines across Europe hadn't been drawn so subtly yet. Until 1950, nations like Italy, Yugoslavia, Greece and Turkey looked like they could go either way. So the great powers started doing everything they could to make sure that these nations would come down on their side of the fence. Because as we know today, once these nations picked a side, that was their side for the next five decades. Many would argue the US and China are headed towards, if not already in, a new Cold War. And because of which Asia, in 2020, is beginning to mirror the Europe of 1946. The US already has a good number of strong allies in the region, with Australia, Japan, South Korea, India, New Zealand and Taiwan. But China is also gaining allies in the region, in the form of nations like North Korea, partners in Central Asia, Pakistan, and to a lesser extent nations like Laos, Cambodia and Myanmar. But that still leaves a lot of people in the middle, the Greece and Italy's of yesteryear. Nations like Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines and Vietnam all have feet in both camps but might lean one way or the other. Without a doubt though, the biggest prize for either side is Indonesia, an archipelago of 270 million people, tipped to be the fourth largest economy in the world by 2050. Even the geography for Indonesia is incredible, with 17 and a half thousand islands making up the country. Just to get an idea of size, if you put Indonesia in London, the other corner would be in Kabul, Afghanistan, It is an immensely huge nation. Indonesia is also placed in prime geopolitical real estate. Being home to some of the crucial maritime choke points, such as the Strait of Malacca, the Strait of Lombok, and the Banda Sea. Whichever direction Indonesia takes over the next few years will likely be a huge factor in the balance of power for Asia going forward. Indonesia is the greatest prize. But what is either side doing to win it over? And which direction is Indonesia likely to go? Well, to talk more about that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. From London to Kabul. So I'd start out describing Indonesia as one of the most diverse countries in the world. The breadth of the archipelago, it's made up of 17,000 islands, approximately. And equally... A lot of different languages, a lot of different ethnic groups, uh, very linguistically diverse, very culturally diverse. So fascinating country of 250 million people, a rapidly growing economy, and its importance as a geopolitical actor in a very dynamic and fast-growing region is growing very, very quickly as well. Kyle Springer is a senior analyst at the Perth US Asia Center and a former researcher for the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. Kyle is an expert on Indonesia and its role in the Indo-Pacific. He joins us today. It's a very decentralized country. Most of Indonesia's political power is heavily concentrated on the Western side of the archipelago. And that goes with its uh, economic development as well. Sumatra and Java are relatively very, very well developed compared to the eastern half of the country. Uh, Jakarta has some challenges exerting uh, centralized control uh, from the island of Java, where it sits on the, uh, the, the western side of the archipelago. Now, some of that is by design. Um, when Suharto was president of Indonesia before the country transitioned to democracy, the country was even more politically decentralized than it is now. And uh, as part of the reform era, Indonesia embarked on 
a series of political reforms to give more agency, more control, more resources to local governments. So Indonesia is becoming more decentralized uh, in, in some ways. Indonesia still has its borders drawn roughly to what it was when they were colonized by the Dutch. But during that reign, did the Dutch have complete control over the archipelago, or did they face the same kind of decentralization problems Jakarta has to contend with today as well? It's a fascinating history. So the Dutch clearly had uh, a lot of challenges controlling the archipelago. In fact, they probably never really controlled, had complete compl political control of the archipelago as we know it today. The Dutch, when they had colonial influence in Indonesia, fought a very, very long, bloody and costly war in the Aceh province. And while that solidified Dutch control over the archipelago, it came at a very, very high price for the Dutch. And even as late as just before World War I, uh, the Dutch had really no direct influence over the island of Bali. Uh, Dutch interventions in Bali didn't happen until very late um, in the colonial period. So you're right, the Dutch had a big challenge controlling the archipelago. Uh, they probably had absolute control over some key ports, key trade routes, uh, but they did not have uh, unified uh, and uh, uniform control over the entire archipelago. Going forward to the Second World War, Japan invaded and occupied Indonesia in the opening days of their assault on Southeast Asia. Back then, Indonesia was known as the Dutch East Indies. But how did the Japanese manage to conquer such a large area of territory so quickly? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Look, I think th the Japanese uh, definitely came in uh, expelled the Dutch uh, successfully. And at first, in some ways, the Indonesians saw them as liberators. So the Japanese at first probably had an easy time gaining political uh, and economic control of the, over the islands. And you got to understand Japan's primary reason for invading the Indonesian archipelago was for resources, right? So once Japan had control over areas that controlled and were important for uh, dominating key resources, uh, that was their ultimate objective. Uh, and to also keep uh, Western powers uh, from interfering uh, with their objectives in the archipelago. After Japan surrendered at the end of the war, their troops left, but the colonial powers were still scrambling from the devastation of the war. So a major power vacuum formed in Indonesia. Indonesian nationalists managed to take control of the entire archipelago and avoided it breaking up into a number of smaller different states. But how did they manage that? How did the first Indonesian Republic manage to prevent the archipelago breaking up into a central Javanese state along with other nations like Sumatra, Papua and Aceh? Yeah, excellent question. And I think that's a very interesting one. I think it's because in a lot of ways, the Indonesians, they own their sense of nationhood uh, to their experience with, with the Dutch. They have a shared experience of resistance uh, against the uh, Dutch colonial control over their, uh, over their uh, history, over their resources. And I think that's really what binded the different uh, ethnic groups and cultural groups together in Indonesia and uh, formed their identity. And pretty much the nation of Indonesia as we know it today uh, more or less follows the, the contours of uh, the Dutch uh, colonial uh, Dutch East Indies as um, it existed geographically uh, in the colonial era. Uh, so I think, I think their experience with the Dutch much helped shape their identity. Look, I think there was a risk of certain regions of the country, uh, more far-flung regions, like you say, um, the province of Maluku, uh, I believe, um, had an interest in breaking off and, and doing its own thing. Uh, 
Uh, there was definitely a risk of different ethnic groups feeling that perhaps they didn't have a stake in the development of uh, uh, Indonesia as, uh, as, as it was envisioned at the time. Uh, but I think ultimately uh, the, uh, the Indonesian national cause was cohesive and compelling enough uh, to where all the ethnic groups uh, and different sultanates and political structures that existed after the Dutch uh, colonial era uh, bought into the Grand Indonesia Project. The person who led Indonesia into the Republic era was a man called Sukarno. Can you take us through why Sukarno is so important to the Indonesian story? Yeah, Sukarno was a very interesting personality. He very much led Indonesia very, very early on in its pursuit of independence, its pursuit of democracy, and held a lot of personal power and magnetism. He's definitely left his mark on Indonesian, his legacy on uh, Indonesian political thought, uh, the way the country perceives itself. In fact, some of his vision for the country still remains uh, unachieved today. And you see the current president, Joko Widodo, pick up some of those ambitions for Indonesia. For example, the idea for a new national capital in East Kalimantan it was very much a Sukarno idea, a Sukarno vision of a new capital of a new Indonesia, a new nation. And he was very influential. And to present yourself as very Sukarno-like uh, as a politician is, is important. It's an um, indelible legacy of uh, his founding father uh, influence on the country, definitely. Sukarno actually fought with the Indonesian communists during the Japanese occupation. And during the early 60s, moved the country noticeably to the left. With the Indonesian leader being so tied to the Communist Party, why don't we see Indonesia join in with the rest of the Soviet bloc with the USSR and China? Yeah, in fact, the Indonesian Communist Party was one of the biggest communist parties in the world, I think, uh, in terms of actual membership. Yes, so towards the end of Sukarno's reign, uh, so to speak, there was a wave of anti-communist sentiment. And that led to uh, a series of communist purge purges and um, a wave of violence uh, throughout the country that led to ultimate military control of the country and really put it on its path to uh, Suharto taking over the country. And uh, the next several decades of um, Suharto's presidency and uh, control of the country. From that point, uh, the Communist Party was illegal. Uh, communism in any kind of form uh, was completely quashed. And uh, as a result, Indonesia didn't go down the path of uh, Vietnam or other countries in Southeast Asia because uh, communism as a political force as a social force, was completely destroyed. Suharto, with the help of the military, forcefully took power in 1968 and brought in a harsh anti-communist agenda. This move, though, began much better relations with Washington, D.C., with it being the height of the Cold War at the time. Suharto ruled the country for 30 years until 1998 and enjoyed U.S. support for the majority of that. For a country that had just thrown off Western occupation, why would Suharto choose to bring the nation closer to the West again? I think some of it was Suharto's interest in developing Indonesia's fledgling economy. He was interested in accessing funds and resources from the post-World War II economic and financial architecture that the United States set up. And I think that was a big motivation for Suharto to side with the United States, but you got to also remember Indonesia did walk a fine line in 
being nominally involved with the non-aligned movement to a degree. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, Indonesia was squarely in the capitalist pro-U.S. camp uh, in Southeast Asia and uh, in his policies and in his policy approach. But definitely development and the economics of development had a lot to do with Suharto's decision. I mean, definitely, uh, you know, definitely er early on, you know, I mean, his involvement in the communist purges, I mean, he was definitely uh, an anti-communist. After that, his country is marked by economic development. Um, it's marked by Indonesia through military force in many ways, controlling the archipelago, exerting uh, full um, internal integrity, internal security over the country. And of course, when the Asian financial crisis hit, that all started to unravel. Can you take us through what the Asian financial crisis was and how it affected Indonesia? Yes, the Asian financial crisis started as a currency crisis in, in Thailand, and it very quickly spread throughout the, the region. Uh, Indonesia uh, quickly suffered um, uh, rapid deflation, uh, unemployment, and put the country into a downward economic spiral. And ultimately, this undermined any credibility that Suharto had uh, growing Indonesia's economy over the, the previous years. And, and um, yeah, ultimately, it uh, ended the Suharto presidency. One of the major events in this period was East Timor, the former Catholic Portuguese part of Indonesia, breaking away and forming the nation of Timor-Leste, as well as the prolonged struggle by the people of the eastern province of West Papua, also vying for their own independence, as Papuans are very different to the rest of Indonesia. We did an entire piece on East Timor and West Papua about a year ago, so if you want to understand that side of this conflict in the region, I recommend you go listen to that after you listen to this piece, as we simply don't have enough time to do it justice in this focus. Moving forward to today, we have a functioning democracy in Indonesia, with the current president, Joko Widodo, having no connection with the military, the first president to do so. Around the region, he's known as the Indonesian Obama. So why was he given that title? It's because he looks a lot like Obama. <laughs> Uh, but in a you know, on a serious note, I think when he was elected president, um, you know, I saw on Time magazine he was vaunted as Indonesia's new hope. You know, why why did we have a lot of expectations of Jokowi? Well, he's one of the he's the first president that didn't come out of the uh, military bureaucracy. Um, uh, he wasn't, you know, he's not a general. You know, he had a aura of a humble businessman from central Java. He was an everyday man. Uh, the way he interacted with the public uh, using this um, kind of ad hoc visits to public areas called Blusukan uh, really appealed to the Indonesian people. And uh, a lot of expectations were put on him. I mean, Indonesia is at a very, very critical juncture. Uh, for a lot of the reasons we spoke about earlier, uh, its economy is still developing fast. Uh, to keep its economy on the right track, Indonesia has to build infrastructure, it has to reform its economy, uh, it has to reform its politics. And uh, Jokowi was very much expected uh, as a fresh uh, addition to the um, gallery of uh, interesting Indonesian politicians that hopefully could actually make some changes and really turn the country in, in the right direction. And that's why uh, we called uh, Jokowi uh, Indonesia's Obama. A lot of the major problems Indonesia is up against stem from the logistical nightmare of being such a large archipelago, where infrastructure for transport between islands is often lacking. In some parts of Indonesia, it is cheaper to order goods from Europe than it is to get it from other islands of the archipelago. So how is Joko attempting to combat this crucial impediment to the country's growth? 
Yeah, that's great. So this is one of the things that I work on at Perth US Asia Center. And that comes down to Indonesia's billion dollar infrastructure gap. Indonesia needs, again, billions of dollars of the most basic infrastructure, everything from roads, rail, power, all the way to hospitals, clinics, schools, and they need it uh, as soon as they can get it. Um, Indonesia really struggles to speed goods throughout the archipelago uh, because it's made up of thousands of islands. It's really difficult to develop efficient supply chains. And this is really holding Indonesia's economy back. But the good news for Indonesia is for the past 10 years, a number of governments in the Indo-Pacific region have initiated new infrastructure and connectivity initiatives. Uh, the major development banks have been very active in this space for a long time and continue to help Indonesia's infrastructure development. Uh, but unfortunately, this is also where geopolitics have started to creep in. Uh, as we've seen with the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, China's Asian Infrastructure and in, uh, Investment Bank, uh, these have been cast as efforts by China to, quote unquote, buy influence, not only in Indonesia, but in other countries in Southeast Asia and, and throughout the region. And there's, there's another thing, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It looks like we'll have this completed in November. And the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is a multilateral trade agreement that involves all 10 ASEAN countries and five of ASEAN's dialogue partners. So it includes Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and China. And this trade agreement will mean a lot for the region. It's focused on the Indo-Pacific. Indonesia is one of the major uh, economies involved. Uh, it's very focused on developing regional supply chains. And this will be a major trade breakthrough, uh, probably one of the biggest trade breakthroughs, arguably, since the establishment of the World Trade Organization. And I think that was 1994. And Indonesia is a part of this. So I think this will be an important developing thing for Indonesia. We'll see what they can do with RCEP, uh, but it'll be an important element to their post-COVID economic recovery. So it's unfortunate that Indonesia's very uh, important infrastructure need has kind of become more complicated by geopolitics now. Indonesia is just waking up to its own potential. With the country now on track to be the fourth largest economy and third largest population by 2050. Whilst nations like Australia, South Korea and Japan and the US were putting together comprehensive India and China policies, many of them overlooked the powerhouse that will be Indonesia. But now some governments are starting to come around. And China in particular is starting to realize the threat a region leading Indonesia may be to the balance of power in Southeast Asia. But to talk more about that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. Scattered. Yeah, well, it's not just the geographic spread that's one of the particular issues uh, with governing a country like Indonesia. It also includes the challenges like ethnic diversity, religious diversity, and also even geographic spread. You've got people living in tropical areas, in mountainous areas, and, and, and so on and so forth. So even managing things like agricultural policy, for instance, can be quite a mix. But bringing a country together that historically had been made up of different regions characterized by different identities. I mean, the War of Independence was one way of galvanizing that, you know, as, as a product of that experience of colonization. But keeping the country together has been a primary focus of any president since 1945. Natalie Sambi is a senior researcher focusing on Indonesian military and security issues for the think tank Verve Research. She is also a PhD scholar for the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the Australian National University and has worked with many organisations ranging from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute to the Australian Department of Defence. 
She joins us today. So interestingly enough, you know, Indonesia was a highly centralized country from the mid-1960s until 1998, as we know when President Suharto stepped down. And after that, Indonesia went through a process called decentralization, where a lot of power was devolved to the provincial levels and, and even lower than that. So with that decentralization of, of power also came decentralization of money, which is a bit of a double-edged sword, because yes, you're spreading wealth and resources around the country, but that also means little pockets of wealth and power also develop. So there's always been a constant tension, you know, with trying to empower the various regions and keeping everybody together as part of the Republic of Indonesia. Indonesia is a nation of great contradictions. Jakarta, the capital, has the highest per capita amount of Twitter users anywhere in the world. Yet there are huge parts of Indonesia that barely have electricity, let alone Twitter. Why is there such a vast difference between parts of the country here? Yeah, absolutely. In Indonesia, there are a number of extremely wealthy billionaires. You know, it's possible to go around Jakarta without even touching the floor if you go from a vehicle into a fancy mall, into a hotel and so on and so forth. But, you know, according to um, the United Nations, there are roughly about 10% of the Indonesian population that lives below the official poverty line. So it's about $2 a day. So that's 10% of 260 million people. So if you imagine, that's more than the entire population of Australia living under $2 a day. People often overlook this aspect, but Indonesia is the largest Muslim-majority country in the world. What impact do you think this has on the country's domestic political trajectory? Yeah, look, I think religion is a really important question in Indonesia. Looking from the outside in, often we talk about Indonesia being this Muslim democracy. Um, I think it's really important to point out that um, Indonesia as a state is a religious state and not just you know, in terms of adherence of people to Islam, but also really strong in terms of Christianity, in terms of Catholicism. Um, Indonesia has five official religions, which also include Hinduism and Buddhism as well. Um, and at the beginning, when the constitution was written, there were some planners who wanted to put the word Allah in there to signify the importance of Islam within Indonesia at the time. But in the end, a compromise was made and they used just the generic word for God which is really important because it forms part of the national identity, that Indonesia is not just a Muslim country, that Indonesia is represented by Pancasila or the national ideology, which includes those five religions, which is why in the Indonesian calendar, every major religion's holidays are a holiday for the entire country. So like Hindu holiday, Nyepi, where you turn off all your electronic um, products, that's that's respected by uh, all of the people in Indonesia. You know, Diwali, for instance, is celebrated by Buddhists and Hindus again, Festival of Lights, which is also celebrated in other parts of the world, again, respected alongside um, Eid and um, Lebaran and other kind of Muslim holidays. And Christmas, obviously. Working in Australia's security sphere, we often view Indonesia through the lens of exporting terrorism, particularly with organisations such as JI and Jamaa Islamiyah. How big a problem is terrorism coming out of Indonesia? Is it a threat to the entire region or just a bit exaggerated? It's an interesting question because, you know, we don't talk about Jamar Islamir as much as we used to back in the day. We also talk about ISIS-affiliated groups now, but there are different iterations of Jamar Islamir and different offshoots, JAT, JAS, which are issues that the Indonesian police are now very much dealing with. Um, you know, Australia and the United States and the UK were instrumental in helping raise some of those kind of terrorism capabilities after the Bali bombing and whatnot. Um, but the Indonesian police have done... Um, pretty good work foiling a reasonable number of plots, um, but they're still dealing with um, the remnants of a group that have been ISIS affiliated in central Sulawesi. But having said that, looking into the future, some of the concern is the porousness of maritime areas between the Philippines and Malaysia. Of course, we know Malaysia was harboring the head of the, head, the leaders of JI back in the day. And, um, you know, looking at those kinds of vulnerabilities, uh, looking at other sorts of radicalizations, um, you know, the sense of of certain communities to provocations and to do with caricatures um, abroad, other kinds of things that the Indonesian police would be, would be thinking about and fixated on. One of the largest domestic thorns for any Indonesian president is West Papua, the easternmost part of the Indonesian archipelago. Glossing over many of the details here as we have an entire piece going through the struggle, the Papuan people are very different to the Javanese people who are the majority in Indonesia and they've been fighting the Jakarta government now for decades to become an independent nation, with many Papuans losing their lives in this struggle. Why is Jakarta so dedicated to holding on to a province that the locals are not cooperative in? 
West Papua is important for a number of different reasons. I mean, just taking it in terms of national nationalism and national unity, as you alluded to and I alluded to earlier, every president has got to be thinking about keeping that republic together, right, because of those disparate senses of identity. And in some cases, that's actually been encouraged by the prospect of having a separate identity with decentralised money. So if you can prove yourself to be a separate province, then, you know, there's that. So there are these kinds of drivers. But in the case of West Papua, there are some very specific conditions why any Indonesian leader would be fractious about that breaking away. Um, and one of, of course, is the, the number of resources that are in the West Papua provinces. Um, and it's a very resource intense in terms of mining, in terms of timber. It's very remote away from the capital. So the military command that's there actually has a vested interest in the kinds of business operations that are going on there. It can be very lucrative, lucrative for certain Indonesian businesses as well. But I think, you know, in terms of emotional terms, having had a province breakaway, in other words, Timor-Leste, or what was East Timor, I think psychologically there are a lot of people in Indonesia going, well, it happened once and we will never let it happen again. So that's in part, you know, why Arche was a negotiated agreement that that was so hard, you know, for the Indonesian government to, to even consider letting that go because that was not long after Timor Leste or East Timor and there is no way they're going to let Papua go. Ali Alatas, the former Indonesian foreign minister, warned that if Papua were to break away from Indonesia, this regionalism would spread through the archipelago and may fracture and balkanize the whole set of islands into a bunch of combative states. But how likely do you think this would actually be to happen? Or is it just government justification for their actions in anti-Jakarta provinces? So I think the concern about this balkanization of Indonesia, the domino effect of having one province break away, I think there were legitimate concerns, particularly after the 1999 referendum, that there might be external interference and that might lead and encourage other groups to then internationalise their, their um, independence uh, movements, particularly Arche. There were leaders in Arche who looked at the Timor example and said, right, how did they do it and what can we do in order to be able to replicate that? They were not successful in that regard, but there was certainly that concern amongst Indonesian leaders. So now, though, having said that, the reasons for each province, if there are reasons for certain groups to have wanted to break away, they're not necessarily the same as West Papua. So it's not necessarily the case that because in the very, very unlikely, un in, you know, remote possibility that the Papuan provinces that would become independent under today's conditions, that would have the necessarily same flow on effect. I think there are lots of incentives for a lot of provinces to stay part of the Republic. During the Timorese struggle for independence, the Indonesian military was responsible for the deaths of quite a few Timorese people. And things only settled down with the conflict with a referendum and international peacekeepers intervening. 20 years on, what is the relationship like between Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, and Dili, the capital of Timor-Leste today? Yeah, it's really interesting. The close relationship, I would say, that's between Timor-Leste and Indonesia has been something that was fostered very actively under President Yudhoyono and uh, Shanana Guzmao. They tried very hard to put together a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and put the past behind them. And they are leveraging this idea, ironically, that there's a brotherhood between the two peoples and obviously the sense of shared, shared island between parts of West Timor and East Timor as a connector between the two countries. I think putting it in brutal terms, uh, Timor-Leste could do with a lot of Indonesian investment and support. Um, and I think for Indonesia, it fits very nicely to play this bigger brother role and not sort of be totally annexed out of uh, Timor-Leste's future. But I think there's also another dynamic there which is that there are incentives about the broader strategic context and the role that China is playing, not only in the South Pacific, but particularly on Indonesia's eastern flank. And to have a country like China pouring in not only investment, but personnel and, and, and having far more interest and attention in that area, while China is making other provocations in the maritime domain of Indonesia, has got to cause a bunch of people in Jakarta to say, hey, we better, we better get over to Dili and have a look at what's going on there. We better make it known. But it's also been part of Indonesia's more recent foreign policy to open up its eastern eastern sort of um, side and have a lot more to do in terms of investment and build ties with other South Pacific countries, Vanuatu, Fiji, also to do with the West Papua issue. But certainly I would characterise ties between Indonesia and Timor-Leste today as actually being better than ties between Timor-Leste and Australia, for instance. With a new type of president for Indonesia, Joko Widodo at the helm, how do you think this will change Jakarta's foreign policy going forward? 
Yeah, look, I think there was a time and place for people to have looked at Joko Widodo as the Indonesian Obama. I mean, besides for some of this physical similarities, it was really this idea that he was supposed to be a breath of fresh air, the same way that Obama represented hope and change in an American system that had very, pretty much a similar demographic president. That's because Jokowi wasn't seen to have come from either an elite political dynasty or from the military. And so he was seen as this outsider, a guy who was a furniture entrepreneur who'd made his way up the ranks from being a little mayor and then to a governor of Jakarta and then catapulted into the presidency within a relatively short amount of time. Indonesia hadn't seen anything like it. Nor had they seen anybody who seemed to have a very down-to-earth pragmatic approach in terms of literally rolling up their sleeves, going down to a local bureaucrat's office and saying, how's your job going? He would have these informal drop-ins known as blusukan, which was not particularly characteristic of a political class that was either ruling in an authoritarian way or using sort of the prestige of the military to get things done. He just had a different approach. And he was espousing different kinds of ideas about social inequality and trying to sort of negotiate ways things through and had made some rumblings around 2014 and for the few years after that about addressing some of the unresolved human rights cases. Again, the kinds of stuff that we wouldn't have really heard a typical Indonesian president say. Now, how that's panned out, bit of a different story, but I can certainly understand how people, particularly even in Australia, have looked to the election of Jokowi, Jokowi as something different, something new. Now, has Jokowi's presidency done so far when it comes to foreign policy? Let's look at one of the cases of disappointment from a foreign policy perspective. You know, one of the ways, for instance, has been this slow erosion of rights under Jokowi. Um, more recently, again, if you want to talk about Jokowi the pragmatist, wanting to make business easier in Indonesia, the massive protests that were happening last year in September by students and capitals, major capitals around the country, because there were proposals in this so-called omnibus law that were going to roll back women's rights, workers' rights, environmental checks, um, all these kinds of things, um, which would not be doing very much to improve Indonesia's democracy, rather, as there is scholarly consensus, allowing it to, to regress even more. And that's happening under President Jokowi. Granted, some of those democratic regressions happened, started happening under his predecessor, but one can certainly say Jokowi hasn't done as much to either arrest that trend Or, you know, know, if you look at Freedom House's democracy index for the last four years consecutively, Indonesia's democracy rating has dropped down to 61 at the moment. And its civil rights um, at the moment is sort of slated at 31 out of 60. Now, you you can obviously have another discussion about the validity of these results. But I think that most, you know, democracy researchers in the world have sort of said, look, this is not a good sign for Indonesia's democracy. It's one indicator of a number of, of different things that are going on within the country talk about, you know, maybe doing away elections at the lowest level, you know, talk about, you know, clamping down on the ability to be able to talk about 1965 and things like that. The reappearance of figures from the new order around government, okay, the military is not directly in power, but there are people with new order ideas, the Sahato era ideas, who are very close in government. And so what does that tell us about where Indonesia is heading in future? Jokowi is currently a year and a half into his second five-year term as the Indonesian president but the Indonesian constitution states he can only serve two terms. The party who came in second to Jokowi in 2019's election was the Great Indonesia Movement Party, who are far more religiously focused than Jokowi's party. Do you think we will see them take the presidency in the next election in 2024, or will Jokowi be a sort of kingmaker here? You know what? I think Jokowi will be a kingmaker, but not for the reasons he should be. So let me unpack that for a second. His political rival, who ran against him twice, lost twice, Prabowo Subianto, former army general, you know, suspected of human rights cases and kidnappings, former son-in-law of Suharto, has seen to be have quite sort of strong ideas about um, governing the country. Um, What does Jokowi do? He appoints him as defence minister. And so the only thing that Prabowo Subianto doesn't have, which is experience in political office, he now gets so well done, Jokowi. So if you thought that he was going to try and bring in, you know, a you know, potential spoiler into the camp and stop him, you know, mucking up his policies, I think there's there's a very, again, pragmatic reason, not to sort of stress that point too much, that that's a good reason for Jokowi to have done that. But inadvertently, he's now handed on a silver platter, not only a really important portfolio and budget, 
and particularly uh, potentially all of the um, accolades for military modernization and having a strong policy against China, for instance, he's now given Prabowo a platform and political experience. When you look at other island nations, such as the United Kingdom, they tend to have very large navies with small, well-trained strike forces for land armies to accompany them. Focusing on the navy as their first line of defense is mostly the doctrine of island nations. Indonesia, though, seems to be a bit different than most of the other island nations. It has a huge ground force of around 350,000 army personnel, with another 150,000 in reserve, with a navy that's comparatively quite small and mostly geared towards coastal operations, rather than deep blue water navy projection. What do you think this tells us about the objectives of the Indonesian armed forces? Yeah, absolutely. We have to go back to the genesis of the armed forces. And a lot of it was comprised of irregular units um, that were insurgents fighting against the Dutch, as well as Japanese trained units, as well as Dutch trained soldiers as well. So it was really like a, a composite force that was fighting back, you know, it was a land battle. And if you look at most Indonesian military operations, maybe like one or two exceptions, you know, like confrontation in Malaysia, they've all been internally focused. The military was not used to guarantee Indonesia's external security, but as we keep coming back to that theme of Indonesia trying to be held together as a republic, the military was used for the internal security. The military was used to stop Indonesia breaking up. It also had this really special identity because it was there at the birth of independence, because there's this mythology about this military supremacy within Indonesian society and the very strong political role that it played under Saharjo, it has this entrenched sense of, well, we really run the place. We really know how to run this, this show. And society, Indonesian society, large parts of it, still see the military in a very positive light. You know, as I alluded to earlier, you know, there's this decentralization of power in Indonesia. There's this territorial structure that we don't really have in Australia where you have military representation at all levels of government down from the provincial level, so like state level here, all the way down to like you're basically like your local council, your village in Indonesia. So if you're someone growing up in Indonesia, you see the military all the time. You see the military helping building bridges. You see the military teaching in schools. You see the military building mosques. And what does that make you start thinking, right? So it's about the use of the military, its history, and also its connection with the people. Staying on the military, the Chinese foreign ministry gave a statement saying they will respect Indonesia's maritime borders, but there have been numerous incidents of Chinese fishing vessels accompanied by Chinese naval vessels around the Indonesian Natuna Islands. Can you elaborate a bit on this? Well, yeah, to your point, you know, so due to that history of Indonesia, the army has traditionally been such a well-funded entity. And yeah, like you said, the Navy has had a much less uh, level of modernization. So that is changed. Jokowi came in and consolidated the Coast Guard, but still those two maritime security forces are doing their best to be able to try and repel Chinese um, naval presence, Coast Guard presence, fishermen presence in what's effectively Indonesia's exclusive economic zone. So yeah, China turns around and says, oh, well, yes, it's your economic zone, but really there's an overlap with our with our nine dash, with our historical fishing grounds. And Indonesia goes, we're not even going to countenance that. Because once we start saying that we can negotiate with China about this so-called overlap, we inadvertently accept that there is some sort of dispute. So Indonesia's approach to try and handle China's attempts to kind of interfere, you know, have these incursions into its waters is to say, no, it's Indonesia's EEZ. That's the position under international law. This is what the 2016 Hague, um, you know, tribunal uh, arbitration result came out to be. And we're not even going to count this negotiations. The Natuna Islands are around 2,000 kilometres from China's coastline. So what claim does China actually have on these islands? It's within China's nine-dash line claim. So from, from I think, two perspectives, if you look at this, if you're going to enforce the nine-dash line, you're going to enforce all nine dashes, right? So you're going to make sure that every one of those elements is, is consolidated and you are going to push around every country to show that that claim is robust. And... That has to be situated in the broader context of what China really wants in the Indo-Pacific. And if what China wants is to be able to establish a sense of hierarchy where it sort of sits at the top of that and states are partners but not equals, then it's got to somehow negotiate that status with some of the next largest powers within the Indo-Pacific, Japan, Indonesia, India, 
Indonesia actually pushed back quite hard against the Chinese incursion, hugely boosting the armed presence on the Nichina Islands and conducting large military exercises around the area. Do you think this is a signal of Indonesia's changing military relationship toward China? Yeah, so over the last few years, um, Chinese fishermen have made these incursions around the Nishituna Islands, and then over the horizon, they've been backed up all of a sudden by the Chinese Coast Guard and, and Navy. So Indonesia has been cautious not to kind of provoke that situation too far. Now, in December, uh, a number of Chinese vessels, around 50 or so, moved into Indonesia's EEZ, kept skipping across the border there into Malaysian waters, Indonesian waters back again. That was an unprecedented number of Chinese vessels. That was quite alarming for the Indonesian authorities who sent um, vessels to monitor them. Now, what happened in January is that this became pretty public in Indonesia. And having a president who said, we're going to be really tough on maritime sovereignty, couldn't be sort of seen as weak on that. So he ordered, you know, one of the largest ever military buildups there that included, you know, um, uh, military surveillance, sorry, maritime surveillance, aircraft, uh, troop presence, um, warships and so forth to try and act tough. But again, there's an upper limit to how far Indonesia can actually use military power to push back. Because as I said earlier, there's a limit to how much you can provoke uh, the Chinese, the PLAN. And by the way, China forms one of the most important, not only investment partners and trade partners of Indonesia. If Jokowi is looking to then uh, implement his plans of infrastructure development and human resource development, he's going to need money. And so not only is there a balancing act between not wanting to um, run into conflict with the PLAN, there's an idea of wanting to sort of keep relatively good ties with Beijing at the same time. Indonesia is the largest economy and the de facto leader of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. But what does this mean in terms of its influence over the region? I think Indonesia's been the de facto leader of ASEAN almost since the inception of ASEAN because it was, you know, one of the ideas of President Suharto to be able to make sure that there was minimum amount of conflict within Southeast Asia. For Indonesia, having that role has been pretty important because it's able then to attempt to shape some of the ideas and principles and try and galvanize Southeast Asia as a bloc when it comes to these, you know, potentially security threatening type of moves by bigger countries like China. It's not always successful because you can't have all 10 states aligned on all issues at all times. It can only try. And Indonesia's attempt to be able to have a common vision on ASEAN you know, as, as much as, as influential and as active as Indonesian diplomats were, that was only limited. There was a statement that was made by ASEAN, which was only called the, um, out, the sorry, Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. It wasn't a vision, it wasn't a strategic plan or anything like that. So yes, ASEAN is really important for Indonesia to try and shape the direction, to try and galvanise, but limited in terms of actual output. Many people can see Indonesia's rapid growth and look forward into the future with it, watching Jakarta become the regional leader. Indonesia is already the de facto leader of ASEAN today, and for good reason. And with ASEAN getting more and more cooperation between its member states, it's an organisation to keep our eyes on. But how far will the cooperation go? And will a strong ASEAN be enough of a counterweight to shift the balance in Asia? We'll have to talk more about that. We turn to our third guest. Part 3. Crossing the Nine Dash Line uh, Unquestionably so. It has always been the largest and most consequential power in Southeast Asia. Uh, but it is now truly coming into its own as a global power. Uh, Indonesia is a member of the G20. It has a current population of, of 275 million. And by most estimates, by 2050, it'll be 370 million and, and are in the top five economies in the world. Um, it is a destination for investment from Europe, from the United States, from Japan, from China. Uh, so you know, located centrally uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, it is in every respect uh, a growing, increasingly consequential power, not just in Southeast Asia, uh, but globally. Gordon Flake is the CEO of the Perth US Asia Centre and professor at the University of Western Australia. Gordon is one of the leading experts on the strategic developments for the Indo-Pacific and has authored many policies pertaining to the region, 
Gordon is also the co-chair for the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea and a member of the International Advisory Board for the David M. Kennedy Center. We are very pleased to have him join us today. Well, Indonesia historically was actually one of the founding members of the non-aligned movement. Um, and um, uh, so while, of course, on security ties and other issues, uh, its role within ASEAN did result in some coordination with Washington, I would be a little bit hesitant to use the word closely aligned. Uh, it, it's always been pretty jealous of its own independence, um, less so historically it, with the with the Cold War, more so increasingly as, as it balances the challenges inherent in the relationship with China. Uh, it's it's not unique dependence on China for investment, for trade, for markets. Um, means that it is weighing its security interests in the region, its relationship to the United States with China. And we see that playing out every day uh, in the news every week. Uh, so just last week, you had a, a wonderful article by former Indonesian ambassador to the United States, uh, Dino Pati Jalal, in The Diplomat, uh, basically saying that uh, U.S.'s more aggressive push to try to get ASEAN to to join it in an anti-China coalition was falling on deaf ears in the region. Uh, there was a great article just today in Reuters that was talking about how, uh, despite the fact the U.S. is pushing for uh, bases, not bases rather, but refueling rights for its spy planes in Indonesia, at the same time, the Chinese are offering 250 million doses of a potential coronavirus vaccine. And it just highlighted the very real and ongoing contestation over Indonesia. So I, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to kind of frame it in terms of uh, always being part of the United States. They've always been very jealous of their relative independence. Taking into account the importance of ASEAN, what are countries like the US doing to win favor with these nations? Indonesia, and not only, I mentioned it a minute ago as being a leader in the non-aligned movement, uh, it has also been a leader within ASEAN. And ASEAN is a, a, a unanimity-driven, consensus-driven approach to regional integration, which has at its forefront uh, a deep appreciation for uh, and is an abiding commitment to multilateralism. Uh, there are many things you can say about the last four years under the Trump administration, but multilateralism is not one of them. So from the very first day of the Trump administration, the decision on the part of the United States to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a uh, regional free trade agreement, uh, deprived Indonesia, which was keenly interested in you know, later accession of a key goal economically, and the United States of a leadership role in that region. Uh, relative to, say, NATO or Canada or Mexico or even South Korea, Southeast Asia has avoided quite a bit of disruption, just because they haven't been the target of ire uh, under President Trump. But at the same time, they really haven't been the target of a lot of courtship either. Uh, the, the Trump administration's foreign policy has been one founded primarily on the presumed power of unpredictability, uh, which works relatively well in, in, in dealing with uh, potential adversaries or, or competitors like China. It doesn't work very well in coordinating policy with allies and it certainly hasn't worked extremely well uh, in Southeast Asia, where predictability, support for institutions has been at the fore. So I, I would say uh, the progress, and there has been progress in U.S.-Indonesia relations over the last four years, has come probably not because of the United States, but in spite of the United States. It's out of a growing concern for the region about Chinese influence and the desire to make sure that they have options, that they can maintain their, their relative uh, independence in that process. And turning over to the biggest hotbed at the moment, what is Indonesia's position on the South China Sea? So as I was saying, Indonesia traditionally has been really loath to be drawn into other conflicts, and whether it was the Vietnam War or the Cold War more broadly, etc. Uh, you know, it took seriously its founding membership in the non-aligned movement um, and one of the great failures, I would argue, of Chinese policy in the last decade is the fact that they've, they've successfully motivated Indonesia to, to be interested in and invested in the ongoing territorial disputes in the South China Seas. Uh, 
Historically, these were disputes primarily between uh, claimant states were direct claimant states like the Philippines or, or Malaysia or Vietnam and China. Uh, but China's overreach in the last three years, claiming good chunks of the Natuna Sea, uh, where they're the Indonesian Natuna Islands, have really motivated Indonesia to be very proactive, uh, not only in contesting Chinese claims, but in working together to coordinate an ASEAN response to Chinese claims. And so you really have to understand a lot of proactive Indonesian diplomacy over the last several years in the context of its response to China. Um, again, pretty carefully calibrated, you know, understanding that they need Chinese investment and Chinese trade uh, and Chinese economic assistance, right? But at the same time, wanting to, to make sure that they, you know, push back uh, where needed on China. So, uh, you know, the fact that you've had, you know, the you know, Indonesian fisheries and maritime ministers blowing up Chinese fishing boats which few other countries in the region would dare to do. You know, the Indonesian president, Joko Widodo, out there on, on, on military vessels in the Datuna Islands, in the Datuna Sea, you know, clearly laying down his view of Indonesian territory uh, and, and being proactively engaged in that process. Or even more recently, Indonesia's decision last year to coordinate and lead the process of ASEAN as a whole coming up with uh, an ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, uh, something welcomed obviously in Tokyo, welcomed here in Canberra, welcomed in Delhi, but also welcomed in Washington, D.C., and most decidedly not welcomed uh, in Beijing. Uh, all those, I think, are reactions to, in many degrees to Chinese overreach. As you would know, Indonesia's Navy is very much geared towards coastal defense rather than large-scale blue water operations. Is this an indication that Indonesia is looking to play a more defensive role rather than get more involved in regional conflicts? I think that's just a question of capacity. Uh, you know, um, you know, Indonesia has an archipelago of over 17,000 islands, uh, and understandably, the first priority of Indone any Indonesian government is going to be uh, national unity, the protection of you know, the homeland in that regard. Um, but just as, as um, you know, it, it was only 20 years ago, 15 years ago, that South Korea, despite being, you know, economically uh, much wealthier than, say, Indonesia is, began to think about a blue water navy and began to project outward. It takes a while uh, before countries begin to have that capability. I would anticipate that the developments in the Natuna Sea um, are it's going to be something that will push Indonesia to develop you know, an increasing naval capability just because before that it, it, there, there wasn't a considered to be a need or it certainly wasn't a national priority, but I anticipate that that is quickly ratcheting up the national priority list. A lot of Australian defence papers give the impression of Indonesia being a bulwark against China that China could never properly threaten Australian soil with Indonesia hampering Beijing's efforts in the sea. Do you think that's something we can really take for granted, though? Well, historically, um, Indonesia was also a source of considerable threat to, the, to Australia, not as a, a potential invader, but just you know the sheer risk of instability uh, uh, and, and all the related problems meant that security planners down here had to focus on it in that context. That concern has, has eased tremendously. I'm not so sure that the, the public has come along. I, I, every year I'm stunned by these opinion polls that are put out by the Lowy Institute, et cetera, where you know, a, an alarming percentage of Australians still don't recognize that Indonesia as a democracy. Uh, an alarming number of Australians don't realize that Bali is part of Indonesia and, and don't realize what an important neighbor we have next door. I, I'm someone who firmly believes that it is essential for Australia to get its relationship with Indonesia right. It's our next door neighbor, our closest neighbor. And again, uh, you know, whether it is the fourth largest economy in the world or uh, just within the, the top 10, you know, between now and 2050, even if you know, the more rosy scenarios don't turn out, it will be the you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or 10th largest economy in the world.
uh, and our closest neighbor. And the difference is that we have always tended to perceive Indonesia as a potential source of, of instability, uh, an aid recipient, a country where we have to help. And ultimately, at some point, Australia is going to have to turn on its heel and recognize that we are the demandeur. You know, we're a small population of 25 million people. And candidly, we need Indonesia more than Indonesia needs us. Uh, and the more that we can find areas that we can partner with Indonesia, not just in the region, but globally, the, the more secure that we will be. In 1963, Indonesia went to war with its northern neighbor, Malaysia, with the war lasting just over three years. But what are relations like today between Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur? One of the most important uh, accomplishments of ASEAN has been the provision of a, a context where old uh, and long seated disputes within Southeast Asia have been forced to be at least temporarily papered over. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, at this point, I think the bilateral relationship between Malaysia and Indonesia uh, is conducted almost entirely in the context of ASEAN and their shared objectives or goals within ASEAN. Uh, and that has been furthered by uh, Malaysia's own internal problems. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the ongoing political instability within Malaysia just means that, you know, Indonesia views Malaysia first and foremost as a partner within ASEAN. What about the other big regional up and comer at the moment, India? What is the relationship like between New Delhi and Jakarta at the moment? So India has long had a a look east policy, the the precursor to their own Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, In in recent years, that has become an act east policy. Uh, And I think it's quite clear that India recognizes itself the the importance of Indonesia to its own role uh, in the Indo-Pacific more broadly, to its aspirational role even in the the South Pacific, as it might go on. So I thought it was quite remarkable that in in late May of 2018, when Prime Minister Modi visited Jakarta, uh, that India, at their request, framed that bilateral joint statement between himself and President Jokowi as an Indo-Pacific agreement. Uh, I would add one thing here too, and that is uh, that um, Indonesia is widely seen as a likely um, target for participation in a quad plus format. So there's been a lot of tension in in recent weeks about the the gradual and in in recent weeks, rather rapid materialization of the quadrilateral relationship between the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. Uh, And there's already discussions about others that might be brought into that, if not formally and informally. First off the rank is, 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 is Vietnam, but Indonesia is viewed in that light. So that is, to me, a further indication of the strategic importance that Uh, India itself places on Indonesia. And how much faith do you have in the Quad Alliance, a military cooperation pact between the USA, Japan, India and Australia over the next five to ten years? Do you think it will remain simply intelligence sharing and joint exercises or will it be the precursor to an Asian NATO? You know, it's funny. um, We we hosted a conference a couple of years ago where it, it, it really played against my own expectations in that Historically, uh, if you talked about regionalism within Southeast Asia, um, it was predominantly economic regionalism. Uh, And it was predominantly economic regionalism that was centered upon ASEAN. So ASEAN-based centrality, ASEAN centrality-based regional economics, where people could agree on that front. And the area where it was really difficult to get anybody to, to agree was on the security front. And so, you know, the notion of it becoming a NATO, you know, the Indo-Pacific becoming any type of a NATO just seemed to be a pipe dream. Uh, And so in that context, you know, the the meeting that took place in Tokyo just three weeks ago, despite the fact that we're in the middle of a a global pandemic between the foreign ministers of Japan, the United States, Australia and India, was a remarkable meeting. One that I described as being driven primarily by um, Chinese 
overreach and not American outreach. In other words, this meeting taking place shortly before U.S. election during a time when the broader publics in all of those countries, to a lesser degree India, but in all those countries were increasingly ambivalent about, if not hostile to the Trump administration. The fact that those three countries sought to to um, embrace the United States as a bear hug and keep it deeply engaged in the region, again, was much more um, a failure of China than it was the success of the United States. Now, having said that, uh, it's never going to be a NATO. It's not going to be institutionalized and structured in terms of a affordable alliance. You've already got two countries that already have treaty alliances with the United States that are members of the Quad in terms of Japan uh, and Australia. You know, India, by its very makeup, is unlikely to go down that route. But I think for all countries in the Quad and other countries in the region, it will be an important um, balancer uh, in an era of constant, uh, contestation in the region and in an era where most countries, again, while not wanting conflicts with China, want to make sure that that the region is not entirely dominated by China. So it, it has to be viewed as part of a regional effort to keep the United States active and engaged in the region to the benefit of the others. So in your opinion, where does the future lie for Jakarta? Is Jakarta's future facing towards Beijing or facing towards Washington? Or do you think they will try to continue to work the non-aligned movement? I think you know, the preference of Indonesia and most countries in Southeast Asia would be to have their cake and eat it too, right? They don't want to choose. And that's a message that we've heard over and over again, that yes, these countries, Indonesia foremost among them, are concerned about rising Chinese influence, concerned about Chinese militarization in South China Seas, concerned about Chinese assertiveness in foreign policy and security and a whole range of issues. Uh, but they are not keen to pick sides because just like Australia or South Korea or almost every other member of ASEAN, these are all countries that find themselves in a situation where they rely on China economically or at least have a perceived reliance on China economically because China is their largest trade partner and yet they rely upon the United States to provide the security for the region and to enforce what Australians would call the rules-based order, the global common, the rules of the road. And so they want both. Uh, and that's not, not necessarily a surprise. Their ability to continue to have both is going to depend on two factors. You know, one, uh, whether or not China continues down the path that it has been going since Xi Jinping was elevated, not just to, 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 to premier, but to be emperor for life, right? Um, and in if China continues to go down that road, uh, having both becomes increasingly difficult and people will be forced to make a choice. But that choice then also depends on the, the willingness and the capability of the United States to carry out the role that it has since in the end of World War II. Now, I don't think that we're likely to have really crystal clear answers to those two questions uh, in the next couple of years. And that's precisely why Countries like Japan are so keenly interested in working together with Australia and India. And while India is so keenly interested in working together with Japan and Australia, and Australia, of course, the other two as well. And then they likewise are delighted when Germany announces that it has an Indo-Pacific strategy. And they're delighted when France asserts that it, uh, you know, having the second largest maritime EEZ in the world, is also an Indo-Pacific power. And they're delighted when the UK asserts itself in the Indo-Pacific because uh, in, in times of uncertainty, people are looking for more friends, not fewer friends. Um, I think that approach uh, will be um, aided and embedded by a change in Washington, D.C., but certainly you know, there are uncertain years ahead uh, depending on you know, the, the developments in the U.S. and in, in, in Beijing. Imagine knowing in advance what the next big tech startup will be. Having the ability to get in on the ground floor before it takes off. It would be huge. Well, Indonesia is that startup, even if a lot of people haven't seen it yet. Well, the US asks for refueling points for its spy planes, China is offering millions of doses of their coronavirus vaccine. Knowing the goodwill purchased now 
will pay off greatly for China later. But there are changes happening in the halls of power throughout the West. Australia is finally starting to roll out the beginnings of a proper two-ocean strategy. India is working closely with Jakarta in the eastern parts of the Indian Ocean. And Japan is investing heavily into Indonesian infrastructure. The hope being that every job created in Indonesia is a job not given to China. An investment that will tie the governments of Tokyo and Jakarta closer together, with the hope being that those investments last for decades to come. In 1948, the US went all out with its Marshall Plan, building up and investing heavily into Italy, Greece and Turkey. Yugoslavia did not receive that same level of funding, and the results of which are still stitched into the fabric of Europe today, with all three nations that received the funding being NATO partners, and Italy and Greece being some of the cornerstones of the European Union to this day. All because the US could read the writing on the wall in 1948. Well, that writing is on the wall again. The question is, though, will the West choose to read it? Thank you so much to everybody who tuned in for this episode. This one meant a lot to me, with Indonesia being so close to my home. As I said earlier on in the piece, we really didn't take time to go into the complex issue that is West Papua, Timor-Leste, and Aniache provinces, because we just couldn't do it justice in this piece without making a three-hour episode. We have a whole other piece just focusing on that issue from around a year ago, and I recommend you check that out to understand that aspect of this very complex country. If you want to support the show, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Red Line Pod. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Mike Kelly at Oz. Oz is in Australia. If you want to show your support further, you can help us keep the program going and allow us to tackle bigger and bigger stories. You can do this by donating to our Patreon. Every dollar we earn from our Patreon goes right back into the show and helps us cover admin costs and hosting fees and lawyers and all the associated costs that come with running a show like this. Our Patreons are absolutely amazing, and I regularly catch up for a vodka or a tea with many of them each week. But if you sign up this week, you'll be invited to our next group Patreon coming up in a few weeks, where we do a live Q&A, where I will answer all your burning questions, and we also hang out and talk smack on a few countries as well. As always, a huge thanks goes out to this week's guests. Kyle Springer is incredibly knowledgeable about the Indo-Pacific, and has an amazing knack to be able to see the important trends before most people do. He has a fantastic collection of work, and I recommend you go check him out on Twitter on at KV Springer. Natalie Samby came to me incredibly highly recommended, and I can see why. She is a level of person entire governments turn to for her expertise on this region, and has the deepest knowledge I have ever come across when it comes to the inner workings of the Indonesian military. We will be very sure to have her back on the program sometime soon as she was an absolute pleasure to work with as well for this piece. You can find Natalie on Twitter at Security Scholar. Gordon Flake is a legend in the international relations community here in Australia. His insights are second to none. He not only has a fantastic grasp on the complexities of the region as a whole, but also intimate knowledge of countries like North Korea, Indonesia and Laos. And I would say if you want to understand Australia's two ocean strategy, Gordon is the man to follow. And you can find Gordon on Twitter on at LG Flake. I would also like to thank friend of the show Hugo Seymour for helping with the research and coordination for this episode. Hugo has been crucial in helping craft the state's Indonesia policy and has some amazing insights when it comes to Australia's regional partnerships. You can find Hugo on Twitter at Hugo F. Seymour. This show wouldn't be possible without my fantastic team. So once again, I would like to thank Mark Spencer from the amazing Climactic Network who does all the voiceovers that aren't mine. Mark has been doing huge work at the moment to help pressure and shift the Australian government's climate policy, and it's making progress. If you want to help with Mark's cause or ask him any questions, you can find Mark on the Twitter handle at Climactic Show. I also have to thank the amazing Joe Hawthorne, who helps clean the audio in these interviews. Joe's work is amazing as always, and if you need someone to help clean your audio or edit your show, you can find him at Joe Hawthorne 77 as is tradition around here, the final thanks goes out to you for listening to the program. All of your DMs, questions and tweets have really been amazing and I enjoy answering all of them and getting to know each and every one of you. I've met so many fantastic people through the show and I want to keep doing that. So please, keep them coming. We will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night.